uh, after two years working in spatial statistics, I discovered, I will talk about it later on, I discovered that spatial statistics come from Africa. Uh, and then since then, I, I used to uh, apply a lot of my theoretical model to spatial data and then to real problem. Uh, what can I say? Oops. And another deep um, involvement, involvement uh, of, uh, say, my work in the community is um, about working to promote uh, women in mathematics in, in developing world, in, in particular in Africa. I think that I... Uh, thank you very much, Sophie. So uh, let us go quickly. The professor Samuel. Thank you so much, and everyone, uh, welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Samuel Malili. I'm a professor of statistics at Jomkatara uh, University of Agriculture and Technology. I'm also adjunct professor at Strathmore University, where I did a center for health analytics and disease modeling. I did my masters and my PhD both from Belgium, that is uh, Hasselt University and also Leuven University, both in Belgium. Uh, then actually I joined the university in uh, 2007. Then after that I left and joined the Center for Disease Control. Uh, that, that is the US Embassy in Kenya, where I have worked for eight years. And that's where now my interest for disease uh, came in, because I was actively involved in HIV, that is a national estimate, where we are estimating the burden, the impact, uh, and the need uh, for HIV modules and things like that. So after that kind of way, I turned myself into a disease modeler where I did uh, some trainings, both at Ibidio College in London, I think twice, and also at uh, Institute of Disease Modeling in Seattle, US, where I've been also trained on disease modeling. So by my training, my initial background is about statistics, but the time went on over time, until I crossed to apply mathematics where now I'm bringing a lot of this modeling. Here in Kenya, I've been involved in the COVID-19 modeling, where we have been advising the government on measures to take, I think like that. So I think uh, I'm a transformed person from statistics uh, to applied mathematics, where I'm all, now I'm deeply involved in disease models. Uh, thanks so much, um, Staba. Over to Thank you very much, Professor Sam. M. Walili. Uh, so, I think we are missing Bubaka. Uh, so, it seems we maybe have a, a connection problem. Uh, anyway, so before uh, so I continue, so I introduce myself. So, me, uh, my work, I, I am more specialized in, uh, in somehow pure mathematics, but in the last years, I am uh, interested more in modeling complex systems such as, uh, so this is modeling and, 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 and problems from social sciences. Uh, so, uh, so since we don't have Bubakar, so I will just give uh, a quick uh, overview and maybe uh, so uh, some words about mathematical modeling. So it is an interesting subject uh, somehow uh, that describes uh, systems uh, using mathematical concepts and languages and of course maybe as you have heard maybe you have seen so they of they find applications in many in normally in real life so in natural science and social sciences so in the case of infectious disease so mathematical models in general can project how infectious disease progress show the outcome of an epidemic and help inform public health for intervention and uh, mathematical models can take many forms so they can be dynamical models statistical models differential equations and even sometimes strategic so using game theoretic approach so they are uh, in general people are motivated so the motivations in i believe in in, in starting mathematical modeling mostly they come from somewhere uh, sometimes people may change but sometimes people may rest or maybe some people start from pure mathematics and go back to mathematical modeling because they find sometimes it more interesting. 
Uh, so, for example, if you look at uh, the numbers uh, since the outbreak, so since the beginning, uh, so we have uh, around uh, 23,000 papers, uh, COVID-19 papers. So, 23,000 at least. So, this is a huge number of papers that people are publishing uh, and uh, it's, it comes almost every day. And of course, uh, what is important here to know is what is the what is the what is the papers that are that will be useful that will impact the real life and those which are not. Uh, so in this, uh, so here we are going to talk in will our talk so our our presentation so or maybe our discussion will be focusing on uh, so how can how these uh, all these research papers will impact maybe our real life. So publishing a papers and impacting are two different things, and so I think one of the uh, one of the most interesting uh, applications, perhaps in mathematics in the real life, where people are saying maybe this is not the case, is the one-child policy in 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 China, uh, in which which was based in a very naive mathematical models, in which uh, maybe it was decided after a certain point to decrease the number of the growth of the population in China that, uh, that, uh, that, that we, one has to have, so every woman must have one child. So, and the consequences are terrible. So there are advantages, but still there are drawbacks. Uh, so we still do not yet have Bubakar. Uh, so perhaps Jedone, can you, if you can be in touch with him, that would be very helpful. So simple mathematical models, which I can say is the the, the easiest one, which would be say, okay, so if I if I know my position and my velocity, then I can know. Uh, then I can know my position in all time. So this is the simplest mathematical models that uh, that that maybe every student knows. Uh, but there are of course more difficult models, and we have specialists here in this stage who can uh, provide us with more uh, more complicated but still useful mathematical models. So let me just start. Uh, uh, so with uh, Professor Samuel M. Wally. Uh, I'm Walili, sorry. So uh, maybe to provide us uh, an overview of the contribution of mathematical sciences in disease prevention. If you are, if you can also maybe focus in Africa also, that would be very good. So thank you, Mustafa. And uh, welcome everyone on board uh, to this uh, forum. Today this is a forum where we are discuss, going to discuss more about uh, mathematical models and sciences, and I think actually Mustafa has given a very wonderful background where he has said actually uh, mathematical models can be both dynamical, it can be stochastic, can take any form, even sometimes including uh, pure mathematics. So actually there is no uh, distinction in what kind of mathematics is going to take. Now, actually I want to first emphasize the importance of mathematics in disease modeling. If you remember when uh, COVID-19 came, of course, uh, from December uh, last year, uh, around I think February or January, WHO issued guidelines on how to conduct ourselves or to do business in this time. And the question is, I think the very first question, I believe everyone was, how do we estimate how many people are affected, maybe the first 10 days, first 100 days, and so on, how do we estimate the peak of epidemic? How do we estimate uh, the time when this epidemic will end? And those are the those are the major questions. And I believe the beginning of modeling, actually much of it was done even at the time with Ebola. Actually, that's where we had a lot of models that came to rise. But I think as Mustafa has alluded, there has been many models now than any other time for COVID. As he has said, we have about 23,000 per application, and I believe more on COVID. But the question is, now, to answer some of these questions, what tools do you need? And I can tell you, mathematics has come at forefront. I think this time than never before. And before I talk from a global perspective, I would like to give a Kenyan experience, uh, what actually we did in Kenya. I remember when COVID came, around December, I had a training on mathematical modeling in our country at Job Kenyatta University. And uh, in January, I had a small team of mathematicians that we came together. And I remember one of them asked me, 
uh, prof, can we do something? That time there was no COVID in Kenya, there was nothing happening in Kenya, but we decided let's form a modeling group. That was quite amazing. Around February, uh, I got a call from CDC in Nairobi asking Malili. I remember when I was working in CDC, so I just resigned. I just resigned from CDC uh, from last year. Then they asked me, are you doing anything on modeling? Actually, they were surprised that I was ahead in time with my team because we had prepared a mass script even before the very first case in Kenya. And therefore, they called myself and my team and we formed a national uh, team in Kenya that was to advise the government and the ministry of the measures to take. And I remember the very first question was, what would be the impact of uh, non pharmaceutical uh, interventions in Kenya? If, for example, we close the schools, uh, the government imposes curfews, the government imposes travel restrictions. What are the impact? And quickly, I remember when I had some call with the director at Ames, and I think also some people in Tanzania, we had a call to discuss what are we going to do. And I remember at that point, we decided let's run a quick uh, model uh, to answer this question. Because there was no information, there was not much uh, to know what to do. And I believe that's where I started I started seeing the power of mathematics. Of course, that was not the beginning of where I saw the power of mathematics. But at that point, I saw the power of mathematics because this is a government, these are the medical doctors, these are policy makers who are waiting for someone to give them direction on what to, on what measures and intervention uh, to take. So I can say actually mathematical models have been there, but I believe in Africa we have not utilized mathematical models. And let me just uh, go back to my experience, as I said, I was working in CDC as a senior statistician in Senda at uh, the Division of Surveillance and Epidemiology, where even I was earning good money. But I decided to resign because of the first 10 years, much of the models that were done for HIV were done by guys from Ibidio College, people from New York, uh, and from other countries. And I was there trying to say, hey guys, can we have modelers in Africa? Can we have modelers in Kenya who are going to model HIV dynamics in Kenya? And I can tell you, for the last 10 years, I did not succeed. I decided to resign myself and form the team now that's going to agitate for modelers in Africa. And even now, we are trying to talk to the government with the National Health Control Council to see, can we have Kenyans who are going to model HIV? And I think, actually, thanks to COVID, now the government has realized in Africa, there are mathematicians, there are people who can model disease. And I can tell you, uh, it's only South Africa where they have succeeded uh, to do their own models, for example, for HIV. In Kenya, we still use Spectrum, we still use UNAIDS, we still use uh, WHO. And I can tell you as I speak now, this week we had a, a seminar in Nairobi uh, on uh, UNAIDS models uh, to model the HIV dynamics in Kenya. You see that they're called Naomi, uh, which is developed by uh, UNAIDS. And to me, I'm not opposed to UNAIDS, I'm not opposed to Naomi models, but I'm thinking it's high time we have our own homegrown model. And I think the question is, over the many years, why don't we have homegrown model in Africa or, or in Kenya for that matter? And I think the problem is the disconnect between the academics and the research. Because when you go to class, go to teach, it's purely theoretical. Of course, I know the trend is changing now. Actually, I've seen in a mathematical department uh, from last year, they have started changing now and embracing the fact that we can move beyond the classroom and join the industry. So I think in my uh, part in short for now, maybe I'll come talk uh, later. I think what we have, and this now we should, we should, I think the HAMES should even HAM are doing, is to provide a forum where we are going to have a disconnect from, uh, uh, main connection, sorry, between academics and industry, so that whatever we teach is relevant. Because to me, I believe, even if I prove the OREM, the OREM I show stability analysis, I do all those kind of things, discipline equilibrium, academic equilibrium, it's good for academics. But how do we relate that to reality? How do we model our own diseases, the TB, HIV in Africa? Of course, I know we get money from UNAIDS, we get money from WHO, we get money from CDC, but I believe it's high time now we dictate, we dictate our own course because I've been there working with the CDC, the American government myself. 
and I can attest unless we take our own stand like South Africa and say, oh yes guys, we appreciate your money, but let us as Africans model our diseases. Let us understand our dynamics because I believe we have enough knowledge and we have enough capacity to, to do that. And I think this is a good forum now, like what we are doing now, to showcase. And just uh, to, to wind up, I can say, for example, like uh, through that initiative, last year actually I, I did uh, something called the uh, model transmission in Kenya. So I was given the contract to the model the expert to model the model transmission in Kenya, which has never been done by a Kenyan, it has been done by people from Western. And that was good actually. And this is something actually I can also help. Even you can try to do for other countries so that we can do the model transmission of HIV other diseases without necessarily being done by individuals from Western world. So there is power in mathematics, but more so if we do it for Africa as Africans. Thank you, Mustafa. Over to Thank you, Prof. Samwali. Uh, so I think about Bubakar, so you will have uh, the chance to stay <laughs> for a few minutes before your connection will disappear. Uh, so thank you, uh, so Prof. Mbali, so uh, it is an interesting point, so that you are also here, that you have been doing mathematics, uh, data analysis, and also working with decision makers, so this is an important point, and uh, so I think we will come back to this uh, later on. Uh, so, Bubakar, so please, can you quickly uh, introduce yourself and also uh, just maybe tell us uh, your research work quickly? Uh, okay, I sincerely apologize. My internet is really, really bad today. Um, uh, I'm Bubakar Ba. I am uh, based in AIM South Africa. I'm the AIM's. Uh, the humble research chair of German research chair for mathematics of data science. Uh, in my previous life, which I still live, I guess, I was doing uh, uh, mathematics of signal processing, compressed sensing related research. And I'll probably mention a bit of that because it's related to how do you use mathematics also to prevent disease. So currently we work on different uh, questions around machine learning, data science, and, and, and deep learning. And we're interested in both theoretical questions, the mathematics that try to understand, make us understand how these algorithms work, and we can give rigorous guarantees why they work the way they're working. And also, but also we want to apply it to real life problems like problems come from agriculture, health, or energy. And uh, these are some of the problems we're working on right now. Uh, thank you very much, Bubaka. So, uh... So we were in the subject, we were talking about uh, mainly uh, so about uh, the participants in this panel to provide an overview on the contribution of mathematical sciences for disease prevention, in particular in Africa. So we, there will be no problem also when you focus, if you focus also in the field of your research, or maybe if you can also, like Professor Samuel M. Walili, so maybe if you have worked with decision makers or anything, so just to give a quick overview of uh, how do you see the contribution of mathematics in uh, disease modeling. So uh, I will just give the question directly to Professor Sophie Dabo. Thank you, Mustafa. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about a field I know very well, um, namely spatial statistics. To f a few words before um, saying something in this field. So I can tell you that African scientists always made um, important contribution to mathematical science. But I think that we have problem in Africa to highlight uh, our contribution. And even African statistics, African mathematicians, they do not know that uh, we, in Africa, we do excellent work in, in, in mathematics and namely here in, um, um, in disease, in disease modeling. Um, a, very a very simple example is um, when you do uh, disease mapping or diffusion, modeling diffusion uh, among countries or neighborhood, uh, cities, etc. So 
using the time and space is very important. And in this field, um, Africa, the first model was proposed in Africa. The first model was that of Krish uh, in Junior in South Africa. Uh, let's say at the beginning of the 16s, he proposed a very efficient and simple model, prediction model named Krigin, based on a very naive um, idea, taking a mean and then weighting the mean uh, based on some proximity. And he proved that the, this prediction was the best, um, let's say, linear predictor available um, when you support that your, your data is Gaussian. And among the more than 20, 23,000 papers on COVID Mustafa talk about, some of them are dedicated to um, diffusion modeling, modeling the diffusion of, of the, the disease and also mapping the disease. And most of them use spatial statistics. And nowadays, even in a uh, big data problem in machine learning using kernel method, uh, spatial statistics is used namely this screening prediction method, even if data are not, have not a spatial component. So the prediction of Krish, the prediction model of Krish is used. And this is not, sadly, this is not known in Africa. In the other uh, countries, it's well known and used every, every day. Um, and I can say proudly that uh, some of the modern techniques in statistics when you have time and space, or only space components, they use spatial statistics, and then they use the work from Africa. And this is typically an uh, excellent example to say that um, um, African scientists always contribute to mathematics, but this contribution... While we talk about millions and 100,000 may not scratch the surface, but it was still kind of getting into the right direction. Uh, we have another organization here in Kenya called Kitab. What they did was they started aligning themselves to the school heads, um, associations, some of the other associations, and then reached out to 24,000 schools in preparation for schools reopening and, and preparing the schools to sort of take on sort of technology-based learning. Um, if you take the South African government, they enabled and another organization called Siapula to, to sort of, you know, target all the students that are out of school to sort of go onto their platform. And th this company is well on their way to reach a target of 1 million questions on maths and sciences through their interactive platform. So while, while there was, you know, no reach, there was still uh, another different ways to reach uh, the students, uh, different ways. Another kind of structural challenge, and which has been discussed already by Teresa, by Honorable Gaspard, is that of access to technology by the majority of students when they're at home. And by access, I mean the acquisition and affordability of devices, and in a lot of cases, the internet. Many of the governments did, as, as the Honorable Gaspard said, even in uh, Rwanda, you know, broadcasting lessons were started through TV and radio channels. But even those fantastic efforts left so many students out because those devices were simply not available at home. This, this is mostly true in the rural care uh, areas of the countries or even disadvantaged neighborhoods in the urban areas. However, if you look at a flip side of some of these emerging edtech solutions that are trying to overcome the challenges of equity, I have two prime examples. They're both based in Kenya. One is M. Shule and the other one is Eneza. Again, two, diff two organizations are supported by the foundation here in Muscat Foundation. Their solutions work via simplest of forms, uh, feature phones, uh, with SMS kind of uh, revision learning. If you take Enesa, for example, um, they, they used to charge three shillings, which is like three US cents a day for unlimited, asking a que question to teachers and revision uh, exercise using a feature phone. Again, it may not reach all the students, but it did fantastic. And the other thing they did was, and this is something that uh, Honorable Gaspard also talked about in Rwanda, where the telcos, came into play. Uh, Safaricom, the sort of um, mobile operator here in Kenya, 
partnered with Eneza to avail free access to the Shubhavu platform. This is the Eneza's platform, uh, which enables students to ask teachers questions and get responses as they revise. Um, this saw Eneza's kind of questions being asked. They used to average around 2,000 questions a day. This rose up to 200,000 questions a day when this platform was being accessed for free. So, you know, there are some breakthroughs uh, and some organizations that have challenged the status quo and gone around the challenges to provide, you know, education technology solutions. We're not all there yet, but there's still some fantastic uh, lessons to be learned from these. And a third challenge, um, which exists in some of the countries, is where either the national education or content regulators disallow edtech companies to promote educational content unless it has been approved. While I don't see that as a problem, uh, you know, I do see the importance of ensuring quality content sort of, you know, so a lot of times aligned to the national curriculum. Often these processes take too long and are expensive and these costs are borne by edtech companies. So that, that is another sort of challenge that perhaps maybe governments need to now look at in during the school closures because of COVID and going forward, how to streamline some of these processes. So more and more ethic solutions uh, are vouched for and can you know parents feel comfortable sort of using them for their uh, learners, their students. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much, Suraj. Teresa, can you contribute to the discussion and perhaps with um, a view towards the future of ed tech on the continent as well? Sure. Um, and what I want to start with is lessons from a report that we commissioned in 2018. And so we've looked across the globe and identified countries that had showcased significant foundation building towards equitable ed tech, which had scaled to encompass a majority of their countries. And in this process, we identified China, Chile, Indonesia, and the United States. So there were a number of commonalities across all of these markets, which um, essentially were telling us what is the way forward as we think about the onus on governments, on entrepreneurs, on funders within the space to really create a more viable ed tech market and ensure that this element of equity um, is certainly critical and encompassed in this scale. And so what we learned were essentially four items. One is you need the proper infrastructure. You need to have the necessary enabling infrastructure, whether it's all the way from electrification to telecommunications to broadband and the hardware itself. Unless this is foundational, it will be impossible for ed tech um, initiatives, innovation um, to really flourish in a market. And we know in our continent, I know um, certainly Suraj's uh, perspective is that we haven't been disappointed because we continue to see innovation. I would say we would see more innovation, we would see greater adoption um, did, were we to have some of these elements that I'll highlight. Um, another component was also on just the market uh, capabilities in, in Africa or in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so as we look here, we know that families already spend anywhere between 20 to 30 percent of their annual household income on education and so when you think about shifting that to now affordability of additional um, access to tools to devices to content you're asking that much more of families and so where does the onus lie for actually supporting and funding some of these initiatives um, is one of the queries that we have and so as entrepreneurs struggle to understand the market dynamics of what works and what might might be a future I think a critical component has really been the role of government, of clear procurement policies that enable and partnership with ed tech entrepreneurs that enables them to actually succeed and create a market. So unless you found and create and um, scale a market for entrepreneurs, unfortunately, what we'll see is more ed tech entrepreneurs shifting to other industries. And that is a significant loss for us. So what can our governments do 
to create a more viable opportunity and landscape for our entrepreneurs. Um, the other of which, uh, and I think this is a really critical one, is simply around this, the support, whether it's financial or it's human capital. Now, in the Africa region, we know that only 3% of venture capital funding goes to the education sector, of which EdTech is even a smaller percentage of that. And yet globally, it's a quarter of a trillion dollar industry, and we're not funding or financing it enough. So I think a lot of the things that we've seen is our entrepreneurs doing what they can. Um, however, it is a truly difficult market. And I think one of the most um, the critical takeaways that we've seen from this period is the element of um, inequity that the digital divide has shown us. Usawa, Usawa Agenda in Kenya, which is a research organization, highlighted that only 22% of learners in across all of our counties have access to online learning materials. And whereas most are accessing through broadcast, whether it's radio or television, there's still over 50% who have access to none of these tools and platforms. And so we really have to ask ourselves, how are we building the foundation for the future? The reason I think we were disappointed, I think the reason why we've seen so much dis um, dis uh, inequalities has been because we simply didn't build the foundation. And so now that we know this, let's ensure that we are putting forward the necessary policies in place, that we are engaging with public sector and private sector individuals and innovations and entrepreneurs to ensure that we're not in the same place should we have um, not only a, a pandemic, but opportunities for us to really engage learners and meet learners where they are. Because ultimately, technology is a tool that can be utilized for good. It is a tool that can be utilized to connect, to unite truly in unprecedented ways. But if we don't pay, pay attention into ensuring that it's democratized, ensuring that it truly is flexible, that it is affordable to learners, what will happen is we will have a divide of those who learn and those who do not, purely based on those who have and those who don't. And I think that will be an incredible shame for our continent. Thank you so much, Teresa. I think that's an inspirational vision for the future of ed tech across the continent. Um, the next question sort of continues on the theme of ed tech and technology for education. Um, and Siraj, I'm wondering if you can speak to us a little bit about some of the lessons learned in terms of ensuring that teachers and lecturers are adopting technology in the classroom and comfortable with using it. So I think, um not only were students caught out by the you know uh, lack of the loss of learning but i think teachers themselves are also at a loose end where they were would have liked to continue some sort of remote learning but simply did not have the means uh, some of the ones that i've already uh, reached out to is you know how to connect with the students already at school but even the devices or even the know-how uh, so as now countries fast track their e-learning strategies and something Teresa mentioned was very interesting uh, she said it's the pandemic and, and I want to add on to this next year it may not be a pandemic some some countries may go through uh, you know ravages of war that forces uh, students to stay at home um, another year will have um, natural devastation that forces students to stay at home for you know months on end or weeks on end again resulting in a lot of loss of learning so the e-learning strategies are something that I think, I believe I want to say every government is now putting their heads together to say, we need to come up with e-learning strategies. But as I do that, let's bring back the teachers and lecturers into this, this conversation. I think the first point of action of all these e-learning strategies would be to upskill teachers in parallel to even as they kind of de design the device, etc. I accept uh, Teresa's point that you know more than 50% of students tend to have not have the relevant technology, whether it's radio, TV, phones, computers, internet, etc. But even as that cog kind of is developed into how you know we would reach, the very critical point is the teachers and lecturers. So I'm going to suggest a few things here. One is to you know increase their literacy. So there, there are several levels of learning when it comes to technology. What is basic digital literacy? Can teachers use devices to understand how to use technology and um, the internet, etc.? 
Then there's a second level of training where it is you, you, know, you kind of put your social media off using devices on the side and say, how does integrating technology in the classroom kind of work? So that's a, like a middle level of uh, you know, literacy required and skills required. And the third one is the one of e-learning. Look, it is one thing to be able to successfully use, whether it's a smartphone or it's a actual laptop uh, and the internet, but it's completely another set of skills to be able to remotely run a classroom, which is required in e-learning. So that also level of training is required. And I think these need to be put on a priority level. The other thing, even as those things are happening, some of the other things we've seen in the, in the times of COVID is a lot of the edtech solutions started adapting. And we can still do that as we go into, you know, uh, developing our e-learning strategies. Let's adapt to the devices that teachers possess. I don't know the stats here right now, but most teachers have at least a feature phone, if not a smartphone. So how about if we develop continuous teacher professional development uh, to train teachers, for example, by a smartphone and use WhatsApp as a, as, as a platform, or if they only have feature phones that we try an SMS-based learning. I know of one edtech uh, company based out of South Africa, it's called Instill Education, that is now doing continuous teacher professional development based on the teacher training curriculum in Kenya and Ghana uh, using these kind of methodologies and teachers will just access that training with whatever device they have. So we, we're not sitting and waiting till you know, they get a higher end device, but kind of use what they have. And the third point I'd like to you know, sort of uh, suggest and maybe Honorable Gaspar can talk about this as well from his point of view is even as these strategies are putting in place, what's the incentive for teachers to adopt technology into the classroom? Uh, I think this calls for a kind of some sort of policy change, you know, where not only should continuous teacher professional development be conducted via digital platforms, but also teachers should be able to demonstrate maybe a minimum amount of teaching using technology to either retain their licenses also, or also tie that to some sort of promotions. So I think that's also very important. And I'll, I'll stop here. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, would any of our other panelists like to comment on this or should we move on to our next question? The only other uh, thing I would add, um, apologies, Gaspar, um, is we often vilify our educators. Um, we call out the lack of education attainment or education outcomes from our learners as the fault of our educators. And yet we are not adequately supporting them. We're not paying them well enough. Um, and so, and we're not training them. And yet at the end of the day, when push comes to shove, they're the ones who are held to account for the lack of learning outcomes that we see. And so understanding this, understanding how critical teachers are to classroom success, to student success, it's critical that we continue to invest in our teachers and um, hold them as champions in our classrooms, in our communities, as opposed to those who are vilified for the lack of progress that we're seeing. And I think it's time that we change that narrative. Very important point. Gaspar? Uh, yes, I would just want to quickly comment on uh, uh, the question that was asked before about what are the incentives for uh, the teachers to use uh, uh, to use technology. So I think uh, what you have found is that the teachers actually naturally want to use technology because uh, if we are, if we do it right, and then technology will actually have, uh, uh, for teachers, we have actually some of the benefits because it may reduce actually on the amount of work that they have to do, uh, to do, at, to do at home. So it may uh, actually ha let them uh, take the work where they go. So if they are, if their phone is now their primary tool of teaching, then it's a phone they have everywhere. So they can do all these things uh, wherever they go. So uh, we have found out that uh, this is something that they naturally want to do. Uh, so now the question remains uh, on our side. How do we make sure that we uh, we build uh, platforms that are um, uh, that are easy to use and that are also adaptable to 
uh, the devices they have, uh, as Suraj was saying. So, uh, but again, uh, there is also something else we are in Rwanda, something that is we are in, in investing in, is to make sure that we train these teachers uh, very well. So Teresa mentioned it. Uh, so we want to make sure that we build uh, partnerships uh, so that uh, the teachers uh, or the future teachers who are in training uh, uh, receive proper training and by the time they graduate they will have uh, digital skills that are certified so they will have that certificate to say you know uh, I not only can I uh, use uh, some of these uh, technologies but I can use them to teach so training is very important uh, building a platform